Section zero zero of Selected Works Poems by Voltaire de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Dowell. Introduction from Selected Works Poems by Voltaire de Clare. Nature has the habit of now and then producing a type of human being far in advance of the times. An ideal for us to emulate a being devoid of sham, uncompromising, and to whom the truth is sacred, a being whose selfishness is so large that it takes in the whole human race, and treats self only as one of the great mass, a being keen to sense all forms of wrong, and powerful in denunciation of it, one who can reach into the future and draw it near. Such a being was Voltairine de Clare. What could be added to this splendid tribute by J. Fox to the memory of Voltaire de Clare? These admirable words express the sentiments of all the friends and comrades of that remarkable woman whose whole life was dedicated to a dominant idea. Like many other women in public life, Voltaire de Clare was a voluminous letter-writer. Those letters addressed to her comrades, friends, and admirers would form her real biography. In them we trace her heroic struggles, her activity, her beliefs, her doubts, her mental changes. In short, her whole life, mirrored in a manner no biographer will ever be able to equal. To collect and publish this correspondence, as a part of Voltaire de Clare's works, is impossible. The task is too big for the present undertaking. But let us hope that we will find time and means to publish at least a part of this correspondence in the near future. The average American still holds to the belief that anarchism is a foreign poison, imported into the States from decadent Europe by criminal paranoiacs. Hence, the ridiculous attempts of our lawmakers to stamp out anarchy by passing a statute which forbids anarchists from other lands to enter the country. Those wise solons are ignorant of the fact that anarchist theories and ideas were propounded in our commonwealth ere Proudhon or Bakian entered the arena of intellectual struggle and formulated their thesis of perfect freedom and economic independence in anarchy. Neither are they acquainted with the writings of Lindsay Spooner, Josiah Warren, Stephen Pearl Andrews, William B. Green, or Benjamin Tucker, nor familiar with the propagandistic work of Albert R. Parsons, Dyer D. Lum, C. L. James. Moses Harmon, Ross Wynne, and a host of other anarchists who sprang from the native stock and soil. To call their attention to these facts is quite as futile as to point out that the toxin of revolt resounds in the writings of Emerson, Thoreau, Hawthorne, Whitman, Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and other seers of America. Just as futile as to prove to them that the pioneers in the movement for women's emancipation in America were permeated with the anarchist thoughts and feelings hardened by a fierce struggle and strengthened by a vicious persecution, those brave champions of sex freedom defied the respectable mob by proclaiming their independence from prevailing cant and hypocrisy. They inaugurated the tremendous sex revolt among the American women, a purely native movement which has yet to find its historian. Voltaire and Declare belongs to this gallant array of rebels who swore allegiance to the cause of universal liberty, thus forfeiting the respect of all honourable citizens, and bringing upon their heads the persecution of the ruling class. In the real history of the struggle for human emancipation, her name will be found among the foremost of her time. Born shortly after the close of the Civil War, she witnessed, during her life, the most momentous transformation of the nation. She saw the change from an agricultural community into an industrial empire. The tremendous development of capital in this country with the accompanying misery and degradation of labour. Her life path was sketched ere she reached the age of womanhood. She had to become a rebel. To stand outside of the struggle would have meant intellectual death. She chose the only way. Voltaire de Clare was born on November 17, 1866, in the town of Leslie, Michigan. She died on June 6, 1912, in Chicago. She came from French-American stock on her mother's side of Puritan descent. Her father, Auguste de Clare, was a native of Western Flanders, but his family was of French origin. He emigrated to America in 1854. Being a free thinker and a great admirer of Voltaire, he insisted on the birthday of the child that the new member of the family should be called Voltairine. Though born in Leslie, the earliest recollections of Voltairine were in the small town of St. John's in Clinton County. 
Her parents, having removed to that place a year after her birth, Voltrine did not have a happy childhood. Her earliest life was embittered by want of the common necessities, which her parents, hard as they tried, could not provide. A vein of sadness can be traced in her earliest poems, the songs of a child of talent and great fantasy. A deep sorrow fell into her heart at the age of four, when the teacher of the primary school refused to admit her because she was too young. But she soon succeeded in forcing her entrance into the Temple of Knowledge. An earnest student, she was graduated from the grammar school at the age of twelve. Strength of mind does not seem to have been a characteristic of Auguste Clare, for he recounted his libertarian ideas, returned to the fold of the church, and became obsessed with the idea that the highest vocation for a woman was the life of a nun. He determined to put the child into a convent. Thus began the great tragedy of Voltairine's early life. Her beloved mother, a member of the Presbyterian Church, opposed this idea with all her strength, but in vain. The will of the lord of the household prevailed, and the child was sent to the convent of Our Lady of Lake Huron at Sarnia, in the province of Ontario, Canada. Here she experienced four years of terrible ordeal, only after much repression, insubordination, and atonement, she forced her way back into the living world. In the sketch, The Making of an Anarchist, she tells us of the strain she underwent in that living tomb. How I pity myself now when I remember it. Poor lonesome little soul, battling solitary in the murk of religious superstition, unable to believe, and yet in hourly fear of damnation, hot, savage, and eternal, if I do not instantly confess and profess. How well I recall the bitter energy with which I repelled my teacher's enjoinder, when I told her I did not wish to apologise for an adjudged fault, as I could not see that I had been wrong, and would not feel my words. "'It is not necessary,' said she, "'that we should feel what we say, but it is always necessary that we obey our superiors.' "'I will not lie,' I answered hotly, and at the same time trembled, lest my disobedience had finally consigned me to torment. I struggled my way out at last, and was a free thinker when I left the institution three years later, though I had never seen a book, or heard a word, to help me in my loneliness. It had been like the valley of the shadow of death, and there are white scars on my soul yet, where ignorance and superstition burnt through their hellfire in those stifling days. Am I blasphemous? It is their word, not mine. Beside that battle of my young days all others have been easy, for whatever was without, within my own will, was supreme. It has owed no allegiance, and never shall. It has moved steadily in one direction, the knowledge and assertion of its own liberty, with all the responsibility falling thereon. During her stay at the convent, there was little communication between her and her parents. In a letter from Mrs. Eliza de Clare, the mother of Volterine, we are informed that she decided to run away from the convent after she had been there a few weeks. She escaped before breakfast and crossed the river to Port Huron, but, as she had no money, she started to walk home. After covering seventeen miles, she realised that she never could do it, so she turned around and walked back and entering the house of an acquaintance in Port Huron asked for something to eat. They sent for her father, who afterwards took her back to the convent. What penance they inflicted she never told, but at sixteen her health was so bad that the convent authorities let her come home for a vacation, telling her, however, that she would find her every movement watched, and that everything she said would be reported to them. The result was that she started at every sound her hands shaking and her face as pale as death. She was about five weeks from graduating at that time. When her vacation was over, she went back and finished her studies, and then she started for home again. But this time she had money enough for her fare, and she got home to stay, never to go back to the place that had been a prison to her. She had seen enough of the convent to decide for herself that she could not be a nun. The child who had sung... There is a love supreme in the great hereafter. The buds of earth are bloom in heaven. The smiles of the world are ripples of laughter when back to its Aden the soul is given. And the tears of the world, though long in flowing, water the fields of the by and by. They fall as dews on the sweet grass growing, 
when the fountains of sorrow and grief run dry though clouds hang over the furrows now sowing there's a harvest sun wreath in the after sky no love is wasted no heart beats vainly there's a vast perfection beyond the grave up the bays of heaven the stars shine plainly the stars lying dim on the brow of the wave and the lights of our loves though they flicker and wane they shall shine all undimmed in the ether nave for the altars of god are lit with souls fun to flaming with love where the star wind rolls returned from the convent a strong-minded free thinker she was received with open arms by her mother almost as one returned from the grave with the exception of the education derived from books she knew no more than a child having almost no knowledge of practical things already in the convent she had succeeded in impressing her strong personality upon her surroundings her teachers could not break her they were therefore forced to respect her in a polemic with the editor of the catholic buffalo union and times a few years ago Voltrine wrote, If you think that I, as your opponent, deserve the benefit of truth, but as a stranger you doubt my veracity, I respectfully request you to submit this letter to Sister Mary Medard, my former teacher, now superioress at Windsor, or to my reverend friend, Father Siegfried, Overbrook Seminary, Overbrook, Pa, who will tell you whether, in their opinion, my disposition to tell the truth may be trusted. Reaction from the repression and the cruel discipline of the Catholic Church helped to develop Voltrine's inherent tendency towards free thought. The five-told murder of the labor leaders in Chicago in 1887 shocked her mind so deeply that from that moment dates her development towards anarchism. When in 1886 the bomb fell on Haymarket Square and the anarchists were arrested, Voltrine de Clare, who at that time was a free thought lecturer, shouted, They ought to be hanged! They were hanged and now her body rests in Waldheim Cemetery, near the grave of those martyrs. Speaking at a memorial meeting in the honour of those comrades in 1901, she said, For that ignorant, outrageous, blood-thirty sentence, I shall never forgive myself, though I know the dead men would have forgiven me, though I know those who loved them forgive me. But my own voice, as it sounded that night, will sound so in my ears till I die a bitter reproach and a shame. I have only one word of exhortation for myself and the millions of others who did as I did that night. Ignorance. She did not remain long in ignorance. In The Making of Anarchist, she describes why she became a convert to the idea, and why she entered the movement. Till then, she writes, I believed in the essential justice of the American law and trial by jury. After that, I never could. The infamy of that trial has passed into history, and the question it awakened as to the possibility of justice under the law has passed into a clamorous crying across the world. At the age of nineteen, Voltaire had consecrated herself to the service of humanity. In her poem, The Burial of My Past Self, she thus bids farewell to her youthful life. And now, humanity, I turn to you. I consecrate my service to the world. Perish the old love. Welcome to the new broad as the space isles where the stars are whirled. Yet the pure and simple free-thought agitation in this narrow circle could not suffice her. The spirit of rebellion, the spirit of anarchy, took hold of her soul. The idea of universal rebellion saved her. Otherwise she might have stagnated like so many of her contemporaries, suffocated in the narrow surroundings of their intellectual life. A lecture of Clarence Darrow, which she heard in 1887, led her to the study of socialism, and then there was for her but one step to anarchism. Diody Lum, the fellow worker of the Chicago Martyrs, had undoubtedly the greatest influence in shaping her development. He was her teacher, her confidant, and comrade. His death in 1893 was a terrible blow to Voltaire. Voltaire spent the greater part of her life in Philadelphia. Here, among congenial friends and later among the Jewish emigrants, she did her best work. In 1897 she went on a lecture tour to England and Scotland, and in 1902, after an insane youth had tried to take her life, she went for a short trip to Norway to recuperate from her wounds. 
Hers was a life of bitter economic struggle, and an unceasing fight with physical weakness. Partly resulting from this very economic struggle, one wonders how, under such circumstances, she could have produced such an amount of work. Her poems, sketches, propagandistic articles and essays may be found in the Open Court, 20th Century Magazine of Poetry, Truth, Lucifer, Boston Investigator, Rights of Labour, Truth Seeker, Liberty, Chicago Liberal, Free Society, Mother Earth, and in the Independent. She translated Jean Grave's Moribund Society and Anarchy from the French, and left an unfinished translation of Louise Michel's work on the Paris Commune. In Mother Earth appeared her translations from the Jewish of Libyan and Petters. In collaboration with Dyer's alum, she wrote a novel on social questions, which has unfortunately remained unfinished. Voltaire declares views on the sex question, on agnosticism and free thought, on individualism and communism, and on non-resistance and direct action, underwent many changes. In the year 1902 she wrote, The spread of Tolstoy's war and peace, and the slavery of our times, and the growth of the numerous Tolstoy clubs, having for their purpose the dissemination of the literature of non-resistance, is an evidence that many receive the idea that it is easier to conquer war with peace. I am one of these. I can see no end of retaliation, unless someone ceases to retaliate. She adds, however, but let no one mistake this for servile submission or meek abnegation. My right shall be asserted, no matter what cost to me, and none shall trench upon it without my protest. But, as she used to quote her comrade Diady Lum, events proved to be the true schoolmasters. The last years of her life were filled with a spirit of direct action, and especially with the social importance of the Mexican Revolution. The splendid propaganda work of Wilhelmina C. Owen, in behalf of this tremendous upheaval, inspired her to great effort. She, too, had found out, by experience, that only action counts, that only a direct participation in the struggle makes life worth while. Voltaire de Clare was one of the most remarkable personalities of our time. She was born iconoclast. Her spirit was too free, her taste too refined to accept any idea that has the slightest degree of limitation, a great sadness, a knowledge that there is a universal pain filled her heart. Through her own suffering, and through the suffering of others, she reached the highest exaltation of mind. She was conscious of all the vanities of life. In the service of the poor and oppressed she found her life mission. In an exquisite tribute to her memory, Leonard de Abbott calls Volstrine de Clare, a priestess of pity and of vengeance, whose voice has a vibrant quality that is unique in literature. We are convinced that her writings will live as long as humanity exists. Hippolyte Havel. End of introduction. Recording by Hannah Dowell. Section 1 of Selected Works. Poems by Voltorine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pat Giambattista. The Burial of My Past Self. From Selected Works. Poems by Voltarine de Clare. Poor heart, so weary with thy bitter grief. So thou art dead at last, silent and chill. The longed-for death dart came to thy relief. And there thou liest, heart forever still. Dead eyes, pain pressed beneath their black fringed pall. Dead cheeks, dark furrowed with so many tears. So thou art passed far, far beyond recall. And all thy hopes are past, and all thy fears. Thy lips are closed at length in the long peace, pale lips, so long they have thy woe repressed. They seem even now, when life has run its lease, all dumbly pitiful in their mournful rest. And now I lay thee in thy silent tomb, printing thy brow with one last solemn kiss, laying upon thee one fair lily bloom, a symbol of thy rest, oh, rest is bliss. No, heart, I would not call thee back again. No, no, too much of suffering hast thou known. But yet, but yet, it was not all in vain. Thy unseen tears, thy solitary moan. 
For out of sorrow joy comes uppermost. Where breaks the thunder, soon the sky smiles blue. A better love replaces what is lost, and phantom sunlight pales before the true. The seed must burst before the germ unfolds, the stars must fade before the morning wakes. Down in her depths, the mind the diamond holds. A new heart pulses when the old heart breaks. And now, humanity, I turn to you. I consecrate my service to the world. Perish the old love, welcome to the new. Broad as the space isles where the stars are whirled. End of The Burial of My Past Self Recording by Pat Giambattista Section 02 of Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina. Night on the Graves from the Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare. O'er the sweet quiet homes in the silent grave city, Softly the dewdrops the night tears fall, Broadly about, like the wide arms of pity, The silver-shot darkness lies over all. Heroes asleep underneath the red-hearted rose wreaths, Leaf crowned with honour, flower crowned with rest. Gently above you each moon-dripping bough breathes, a far echoed whisper, sleep well, ye are blessed. O oh, never, as long as the heart pulses quicker, at the dear name of country may yours be forgot, nor may we, till the last puny life spark shall flicker, your deeds from the tablets of memory blot. Spirits afloat in the night shrouds that bound us, souls of the has-been and of the to-be, keep the fair light of liberty shining around us, till our souls may go back to the mighty soul sea. End of Night on the Graves Section 3 of Selected Works, Poems, by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda The Christian's Faith From Selected Works, Poems, by Voltairine de Clare The two following poems were written at the period of my life when the questions of the existence of God and the divinity of Jesus had but recently been settled and they present the pros and cons which had been repeating themselves over and over again in my brain for some years. We contrast light and darkness, light of God and darkness from the Stygian shades of hell. Fumes of the pit infernal rising up have clouded over the brain, laid reason low. For when the eye looks on fair nature's face and sees not God, then is she blind indeed, no night so starless, even in its gloom, as his who wanders on without a hope in that great, just hereafter all must meet. No heart so dull, so heavy, and so void, as that which lives for this chill world alone. No soul so groveling, unaspiring, base, as that which here forgets the after here. And still through all the darkness and the gloom its voice will not be stilled, its hopes be quenched. It cries, it screams, it struggles in its chains, and bleeds upon the altar of the mind, unwilling sacrifice to thought misled. The soul that knows no God can know no peace. Thus speaketh light the herald of our God. In that far dawn where shone each rolling world, first lit with shadowed splendor of the stars, in that fair morning when creation sang its praise of God, ere yet it dreamed of sin, pure and untainted as the source of life, man dwelt in Eden. There no shadows came, no question of the goodness of our Lord, until the prince of darkness tempted man, and yielding to the newly born desire, he fell, sank in the mire of ignorance. And man, 
who put himself in Satan's power, since then has wandered far in devious ways, seeing but now and then a glimpse of light, till Christ is come, the living Son of God. Far in his heavenly home he viewed the world, saw all her sadness and her sufferings, saw all her woes, her struggles, and her search for some path leading up from out the night. Within his breast the fount of tears was touched, his great heart swelled with pity, and he said, Father, I go to save the world from sin. Ah, what power but a soul divinely clad in purity, in holiness and love, could leave a home of happiness and light for this lost world of suffering and death? He came. The world tossed, groaning in her sleep. He touched her brow. The nightmare passed away. He soothed her heart, red with the stain of sin, and she forgot her guilt in penitence. She washed the ruby out with pearls of tears. He came, he suffered, and he died for us. He felt the bitterest woes a soul can feel. He probed the darkest depths of human grief. He sounded all the deeps and shoals of pain, was cursed for all his love, thanked with the cross, whereon he hung, nailed, bleeding, glorified, as the last smoke of Holocaust divine. Ah, this was all two thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, and still he cries with voice sweet, calling through the distant dark, O oh, souls that labor, struggling in your pain, come unto me, and I will give you rest. For every woe of yours and every smart I too have felt, the mockery, the shame, the sneer, the scoffing lip, the hate, the lust, the greed of gain, the jealousy of man, unstinted, have been measured out to me. I know them all, I feel them all with you. And I have known the pangs of poverty, the cry of hunger, and the weary heart of childhood burdened with the weight of age. O oh, sufferers, ye are all mine to love. The pulse-beats of my heart go out with you, and every drop of agony that drips from my nailed hands adown this bitter cross cries out, O oh God, accept the sacrifice, and ope the gates of heaven to the world. Ye vermin of the garret, who do creep your weary lives away within its walls, ye children of the cellar, who behold the sweet pale light strained through the loathsome air, and doled to you in tidbits, as a thing too precious for your use. Ye rats in mines who gnaw within the black and somber pits to seek poor living for your little ones. Ye women who stitch out your lonely lives, unmindful whether sun or stars keep watch. Ye slaves of wheels, ye worms that bite the dust where pride and scorn have ground you neath the heel. Ye toilers of the earth, ye weary ones, I know your sufferings, I feel your woes. My peace I give you. In a little while the pain will all be over, and the grave will sweetly close above your folded hands. And then? Ah, death, no conqueror art thou, for I have loosed thy chains, I have unbarred the gates of heaven. In my father's house of many mansions I prepare a place, and rest is there for every heart that toils. O oh, all ye sick and wounded ones who grieve for the lost health that ne'er may come again, Ye who do toss upon a couch of pain, upon whose brow disease has laid his hand, within whose eyes the dull and heavy sight burns like a taper burning very low, upon whose lips the purple fever kiss rests his hot breath, and dries the sickened palms, scorches the flesh, and e'en the very air. Ye who do grope along without the light, ye who do stumble halting on your way, ye whom the world despises as unclean, Know that the death-free soul has none of these. The unbound spirit goes unto its God, pure, whole, and beauteous as newly born. O oh, all ye mourners weeping for the dead, your tears I gather as the grateful rain which rises from the sea and falls again, to nurse the withering flowers from its touch. No drop is ever lost. They fall again to nurse the blossoms of some other heart. I would not dry one single dew of grief, the sorrow-frighted lashes which bespeak the broken heart and soul are dear to me. I mourn with them, and mourning so, I find the grief-bowed soul with weeping oft grows light. But yet ye mourn for them not without hope, beyond the woes and sorrows of the earth. As stars still shine, though clouds obscure the sight, the friends ye mourn as lost, immortal live, and ye shall meet and know their souls again, through death transfigured, through love glorified. O oh, all ye patient waiters for reward, scorned and despised by those who know not worth, I know your merit, and I give you hope, for in my Father's law is justice found. 
See how the seed germ toiling underground waits patiently for time to burst its shell. And by and by the golden sunlight warms the dark cold earth, the germ begins to shoot. And upward trends until two small green leaves unfold and wave and drink the pure fresh air. The blossoms come and go with summer's breath, and autumn brings the fruit time in her hand. So ye, who patient watch and wait and hope, trusting the sun may bring the blossoms out, shall reap the fruited labor by and by. I am your friend. I wait and hope with you. Rejoice with you when the hard victory's won. And still for you, O prisoners in cells, I hold the dearest gifts of penitence, forgiveness, and charity, and hope. I stretch the hands of mercy through the bars, white hands, like doves they bring the branch of peace. Repent, believe, and I will expiate upon this bitter cross all your deep guilt. O oh, take my gift, accept my sacrifice. I ask no other thing but only trust. O oh, all ye martyrs bleeding in your chains, O oh, all ye souls that live for others' good, O oh, all ye mourners, all ye guilty ones, all ye suffering ones, come unto me. Ye are all my brothers, all my sisters, all. And as I love one, so I love you all. Accept my love, accept my sacrifice. Make not my cross more bitter than it is by shrinking from the peace I bring to you. St. John's, Michigan, April 1887 End of the Christian's Faith Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on March 21st 2009
in the great wide where foot of man ne'er trod there find we nature's church and nature's god here are no fetters though is free as air its flight may spread far as its wings may dare and through it all one voice cries god is love and love is god around within above behold the working of the perfect law the law immutable in which no flaw exists and from which no appeal is made even as the sunlight chases far the shade and the shadows chase the light in turn again so every life is fraught with joy and pain the stinging thorn lies hid beside the rose the bud is blighted ere its leave and close so pleasure born of hope may oft time yield the stinging smart of thorns a barren field but let it be the buds will bloom again the fields will freshen in the summer rain and never storm scowls dark but still somewhere a bow is bending in the upper air then learn the law if thou wouldst live aright and know no unseen power no hand of might can set aside the law which wills the stars no incompleteness its perfection mars the buds will wake in season and the rain will fall when clouds hang heavy and again the snows will tremble when the winter's breath congeals the cloud tears as the touch of death congeals the lustre drop on the sufferer's cheek thus do all nature's tongues in chorus speak think not o man that thou canst e'er escape one jot of justice's law nor turn thy fate by yielding a sacrifice to the unseen purged by thyself alone canst thou be clean one guide to happiness thou mayst learn love toward the world begets love in return and if to others you the measure meet of love be sure your harvest will be sweet but if ye so broadcast the seed of hate ye'll reap again or beat ye reap it late then let your life work swell the great flood tide of love towards all the world the world is wide the sea of life is broad its waves stretch far no range no barrier its sweep may bar the world is filled is a trodden down with the pain the sea of life is gathered up of rain a throat a bed a sink for human tears a burial of hopes a miasm of fears but see the sun of love shines softly out flinging its golden fingers all about pressing its lips in loving soft caress upon the world's pale cheek the pain grows less the tears are dried upon the quivering lashes an answering a sunbeam neath the white lids flashes the sea of life is dimpled o'er with smiles the sun of love the cloud of woe beguiles and turns its heavy brow to forehead fair framed in the glory of its sun gilt hair be thine the warming touch the kiss of love vainly ye seek for comfort from above vainly ye pray the gods to ease your pain the heavy words fall back on you again vainly ye cry for christ to smooth your way the thorns sting sharper while ye kneeling pray vainly ye look upon the world of woe and cry o god avert the bitter blow ye cannot turn the lightning from its track nor call one single little distant back the law swerves not and with unerring aim the shaft of justice falls he bears the blame who violates the rule do well your task for justice overtakes you all at last vainly ye patient ones await reward trusting the almighty's angel to record each bitter tear each disappointed sigh a reward descends not gifted from on high but is the outgrowth of the eternal law 
as from the earth the toiling seed germs draw the food which gives them life and strength to bear the storms and suns which sweep the upper air so ye must draw from out the pregnant earth the metal too wherewith to build your worth so shall ye brave the howling of the blast and smile triumphant o'er the storm at last nor dream these trials are without their use between your joys and griefs ye cannot choose and say your life with either is complete ever the bitter mingles with the sweet the dews must press the petals down at night if in the dawning they would glisten bright if the sunbeams needs must ripen out of the grain not less the early blades must woo the rain if now your eyes be wet with the weary tears ye'll gather them as gems in after years and if the rains now sodden down your path ye'll reap rich harvest in the aftermath ye idle mourners crying in your grief the souls ye weep have found the long relief why grieve for those who fold their hands in peace their sore tired hearts have found a glad release their spirits sink into the solemn sea mourn ye the prisoner from his chains let free nay ope your ears unto the living cry that pleads for living comfort hark the sigh of million heartaches arising in your ears kiss back the living woes the living tears go down into the felon's gloomy cell send there the ray of love as the tree buds swell when spring's warm breath bids the cold winter seas so will his heart swell with the hope of peace be filled with love for love is nature's god the god which trembles in the tender sod the god which tints the sunset lights the dew sprinkles with the stars the firmament's broad blue and draws all heart together in a free wide sweep of love broad as the ether sea no other law or guidance do we need the world's our church to do good is our creed end of the free thinkers plea recorded by sergio baldelli in rome march two thousand nine Section 5 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To My Mother from Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare. Some souls there are which never live their life, some sons there are which never pierce their cloud. Some hearts there are which cup their perfume in, and yield no incense to the outer air. Cloud-shrouded, flower-cupped heart, such is thine own. So dost thou live with all thy brightness hid, so dost thou dwell with all thy perfume close, rich in thy treasured wealth, ay rich indeed and they are wrong who say thou dost not feel but i i need blue air and opened bloom to keep my music means that it must die and when the thrill the joy the love of life is gone i too am dead a corpse though not entombed. Let me live, then, but a while. The gloom soon comes, the flower closes and the petals shut. Through them the perfume slips out like a soul, the long, still sleep of death, and then the grave. End of To My Mother Recording by Rhonda Fetterman
Section six of Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Betrayed from Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare. So, you're the chaplain. You needn't say what you have come for. I can guess. You've come to talk about Jesus' love and repentance and rest and forgiveness. You've come to say that my sin is great, yet greater the mercy heaven will meet if I, like Magdalene, bend my head and pour my tears at your Saviour's feet. Your promise is fair, but I've little faith. I relied on promises once before. They brought me to this this prison cell with its iron barred window its grated door yet he too was fair who promised me with his tender mouth and his christ-like eyes and his voice was as sweet as the summer wind that sighs through the arbors of paradise and he seemed to me all that was good and pure and noble and strong and true and brave I had given the pulse of my heart for him, and deemed it a precious boon to crave. You say that Jesus so loved the world he died to redeem it from its sin. It isn't redeemed, or no one could be so fair without, and so black within. I trusted his promise. I gave my life. The truth of my love is known on high. If there is a God who knows all things, his promise was false, his love was a lie. It was over soon, oh, soon the dream and me, he had called his life, his light. He drove me away with a sneering word, and you Christians said that it served me right. I was proud, Mr. Chaplin. Even then, I set my face in the teeth of fate, and resolved to live honestly, come what might, and sink beneath neither scorn nor hate. Yes, and I prayed that the Christ above would help to bear the bitter cross, and put something here, where my heart had been, to fill up the aching void of loss. It's easy for you to say what I should do, but none of you ever dream how hard is the way that you Christians make for us. With your sin no more, trust the Lord. When for days and days you are turned from work with cold politeness or open sneer, you get so you don't trust a far-off God whose creatures are cold and they so near. You hold your virtuous lives aloof, and refuse us your human help and hand, and set us apart as accursed things, marked with a burning, cane-like brand. But I didn't bend. Though many days I was weary and hungry, and worn and weak, and for many a starless night I watched through tears that grooved down my pallid cheek. They are all dry now. They say I'm hard, because I never weep or moan. You can't draw blood when the heart's bled out. You can't find tears or sound in a stone. And I don't know why I should be mild and meek. No one has been very mild to me. You say that Jesus would be. Perhaps... But heaven's a long way off, you see. That will do. I know what you're going to say. I can have it right here in this narrow cell. The soul is slow to accept Christ's heaven when his followers chain the body in hell. Not but I'm just as well off here, better perhaps than I was outside. The world was a prison house to me where I dwelt, defying and defied. 
I don't know, but I'd think more of what you say, if they'd given us both a common lot, if justice to me had been justice to him, and covered our names with an equal blot. But they took him into the social court, and pitied, and said he'd been led astray. In a month the stain on his name had passed as a cloud that crosses the face of day. He joined the church, and he's preaching now, just as you are, the love of God, and the duty of sinners to kneel and pray, and humbly to kiss the chastening rod. If they'd dealt with me as they'd dealt by him, maybe I'd credit your Christian love. If they dealt with him as they dealt by me, I'd have more faith in a just above. I don't know, but sometimes I used to think that she, who was told there was no room in the inn at Bethlehem, might look down with softened eyes through the starless gloom. Christ wasn't a woman. He couldn't know the pain and endurance of it. But she, the mother who bore him, she might know and Mary in heaven might pity me. Still, that was useless. It didn't bring a single mouthful for me to eat, nor work to get it, nor sheltering from the dreary wind and the howling street. Heavenly pity won't pass as coin, and earthly shame brings a higher pay. Sometimes I was tempted to give it up and go like others the easier way. But I didn't. No, sir, I kept my oath, though my baby lay in my arms and cried. And at last, to spare it, I poisoned it, and kissed its murdered lips when it died. I'd never seen him since it was born. He said it wasn't his, you know. But I took its body and laid it down at the steps of his door, in the pallid glow of the winter morning. And when he came with a love tune hummed on those lips of lies, it lay at his feet, with its pinched white face staring up at him from its dead blue eyes. I hadn't closed them. They were like his, and so was the mouth and the curled gold hair. And every feature so like his own, for I am dark, sir, and he is fair. "'Twas a moment of triumph that showed me yet "'there was a passion I could feel "'when I saw him bend o'er its meagre form "'and starting backwards, cry out and reel. "'If there is a time when all souls shall meet the reward "'of the deeds that are done in the clay, "'when accused and accuser stand face to face, "'he will cry out so in the judgment day.' The rest? Oh, nothing. They hunted me, and with virtuous lawyers, virtuous tears, to a virtuous jury, convicted me. And I'm sentenced to stay here for twenty years. Do I repent? Yes, I do. But wait till I tell you of what I repent, and why. I repent that I ever believed a man could be anything but a living lie. I repent because every noble thought or hope or ambition or earthly trust is as dead as dungeon-bleached bones in me, as dead as my child in its murdered dust. Do I repent that I killed the babe? Am I repentant for that, you ask? I'll answer the truth as I feel it, sir. I leave to others the pious mask. Am I repentant because I saved its starving body from famine's teeth? Because I hastened what time would do to spare it pain and relieve its death? Am I repentant because I hold it were better a grave should have no name than a living being whose only care must come from a mother weighed with shame. Am I repentant 
because I thought it were better the tiny form lay hid from the heartless stings of a brutal world, unknown, unnamed, neath the coffin lid. Am I repentant for the act, the last on earth in my power to save from the long-drawn misery of life in the early death and painless grave? I'm glad that I did it. Start if you will. I'll repeat it over. I say I'm glad. No, I'm neither a fiend nor a maniac. Don't look as if I were going mad. Did I not love it? Yes, I loved with a strength that you, sir, can never feel. It's only a strong love can kill to save, though itself be torn where time cannot heal. You see my hands. They are red with its blood. Yet I would have cut them bit by bit and fed them and smiled to see it eat if that would have saved and nourished it. Beg, I did beg and pray, I did pray. God was as stony and hard as earth, and Christ was as deaf as the stars that watched or the night that darkened above his birth. And I, I feel stony now too, like them, deaf to sorrow and mute to grief. Am I heartless? Yes, it is all cut out, torn, gone, all gone, like my dead belief. Do I not fear for the judgment hour? So unrepentant, so hard and cold. Wait, it is little I trust in that. But if ever the scrolled sky shall be uprolled, and the lives of men shall be read and known, and their acts be judged by their very worth, and the Christ you speak of shall come again, and the thunders of justice shake the earth. You will hear the cry, Who murdered here? Come forth to the judgment, false heart and eyes, that pulsed with a cursed strength of lust, and loaded faith with envenomed lies. Come forth to the judgment, haughty dames, who scathe the mother with your scorn, and answer here, to the poisoned child who decreed its murder ere it was born. Come forth to the judgment, ye who heap the gold of earth in your treasured hoard, and answer guilty to those who stood all naked and starving beneath your board. Depart, accursed, I know you not. Ye heeded not the command of heaven. Unto the least of these ye give. It is even unto the master given. Judgment. Ah, sir, to see that day, I'd willingly pass through a hundred hells. I'd believe, then, the justice that hears each voice buried alive in these prison cells. But no, it's not that. That will never be. I trusted too long, and he answered not. There is no avenging God on high. We live, we struggle, and we rot. Yet does justice come, and, O oh, future years, sorely ye reap, and in weary pain, when ye garner the sheaves that are sown today when the clouds that are gathering fall in rain. The time will come, ay, the time will come, when the child ye conceive in lust and shame, quickened, will mow you like swaths of grass, with a sickle born of steel and flame. I tremble, shrink in your drunken den, 
coward, traitor, and child of lie. The unerring avenger stands close to you, and the dread hour of parturitions nigh. Ay, wring your hands, for the air is black. Thickly the cloud troops whirl and swarm. See, yonder, on the horizon's verge, play the lightning shafts of the coming storm. End of Betrayed Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 7 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Optimism from Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. There's a love supreme in the great hereafter. The buds of earth are blooms in heaven. The smiles of the world are ripples of laughter when back to its Aden the soul is given. And the tears of the world, though long and flowing, water the fields of the by and by they fall as dews on the sweet grass growing when the fountains of sorrow and grief run dry though clouds hang over the furrows now sowing there's a harvest sun wreath in the after sky no love is wasted no heart beats vainly there's a vast perfection beyond the grave. Up the bays of heaven the stars shine plainly, the stars lying dim on the brow of the wave. And the lights of our loves, though they flicker and wane, they shall shine all undimmed in the other nave. For the altars of God are lit with souls, Fan to flaming with love where the star wind rolls. End of Optimism Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 8 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. At the Grave in Waldheim, from Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. Quiet they lie in their shrouds of rest, their lids kissed close neath the lips of peace. Over each pulseless and painless breast, the hands lie folded and softly pressed as a dead dove presses a broken nest. Ah, broken hearts were the price of these. The lips of their anguish are cold and still, for them are the clouds and the gloom all past. No longer the woe of the world can thrill the chords of those tender hearts or fill the silent dead house. The people's will has snapped asunder the strings at last. The people's will. Ah, in years to come, dearly ye'll weep that ye did not save. Do ye not hear now the muffled drum, the tramping feet and the ceaseless hum of the million marchers, trembling, Dumb in their tread to a yawning giant grave. And yet, ah, yet there's a rift of white, Tis breaking over the martyr's shrine. Halt there, ye doomed ones, it scathes the night, As lightning darts from its scabbard bright, And sweeps the face of the sky with light. No more shall be spilled out the blood-red wine. These are the words it has written there, Keen as the lance of the northern morn. 
the sword of justice gleams in its glare, and the arm of justice upraised and bare is true to strike. Aye, tis strong to dare. It will fall where the curse of our land is born. No more shall the necks of the nations be crushed. No more to dark tyranny's throne bend the knee. No more in objection be ground to the dust. By their widows, their orphans, our dead comrades trust. By the brave heart beats stilled, by the brave voices hushed. We swear that humanity yet shall be free. End of At the Grave in Waldheim Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 9 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry. The Hurricane. From Selected Works. Poems. By Voltairine de Clare. We are the birds of the coming storm. August spies. The tide is out, the wind blows off the shore. Bare burn the white sands in the scorching sun. The sea complains, but its great voice is low. Bitter thy woes, O people, and the burden, hardly to be borne. Wearily grows, O people, all the aching, of thy pierced heart bruised and torn. But yet thy time is not, and lo, thy moaning, desert, thy sands. Not yet is thy breath hot, vengefully blowing, it wafts over lifted hands. The tide has turned, the vein veers slowly round. Slow clouds are sweeping over the blinding light. White crests curl on the sea, its voice grows deep. Angry thy heart, O people, and its bleeding, fire tipped with rising hate. Thy clasped hands part, O people, for thy praying warmed not the desolate. God did not hear thy moan, now it is swelling, to a great drowning cry. A dark wind cloud, a groan, now backward veering from that deaf sky. The tide flows in, the wind roars from the depths, the world white sand heaps with the foam white waves. Thundering the sea rolls over its shell-crunched wall. Strong is thy rage, O people, in its fury, hurling thy tyrants down. Thou meetest wage, O people, very swiftly, now that thy hate is grown. Thy time at last is come, thou heapest anguish where thou thyself wert bare. No longer to thy dumb god clasped and kneeling, thou answerest thine own prayer. Sea Isle City, N.J., August 1889 Footnote since the death of the author, this poem has been put to music by the young American composer George Edwards. End of the Hurricane Recording by Lucy Perry in Bath on February the 25th, 2009
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry. Bastard Born from Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. Why do you clothe me with scarlet of shame? Why do you point with your finger of scorn? What is the crime that you hissingly name when you sneer in my ears, thou bastard born? Am I not as the rest of you, with a hope to reach and a dream to live? With a soul to suffer, a heart to know the pangs that the thrusts of the heartless give? I am no monster. Look at me, straight in my eyes that they do not shrink. Is there aught in them you can see, to merit this hemlock you make me drink? This poison that scorches my soul like fire, that burns and burns until love is dry, and I shrivel with hate as hot as a pyre, a corpse while its smoke curls up to the sky. Will you touch my hand? It is flesh like yours, perhaps a little more brown and grimed, for it could not be white while the drawers and hewers, my brothers, were calloused and darkened and slimed. Yet touch it, it is no criminal's hand, no children are toiling to keep it fair. It is free from the curse of the stolen land. It is clean of the theft of the sea and air. It has set no seals to a murderous law, To sign a bitter black league with death. No covenants false do these fingers draw, In the name of the state to barter faith. It bears no stain of the yellow gold That earth's wretches give as the cost of heaven. No priestly garment of silk and fold I wear as the price of their sins forgiven. Still do you shrink, Still I hear the hiss between your teeth, and I feel the scorn that flames in your gaze. Well, what is this, this crime I commit, being bastard-born? What, you whisper, my eyes are grey, the colour of hers up there on the hill, where the white stone gleams and the willow spray falls over her grave in the starlight still? My hands are shaped like those quiet hands, folded away from their life, their care, and the sheen that lies on my short fair strands gleams darkly down on her buried hair. My voice is toned like that silent tone that might, if it could, break up through the sod with such rebuke as would shame your stone, stirring the grass roots in their clod. And my heart beats thrill to the same strong chords, and the blood that was hers is mine today. And the thoughts she loved I love, and the words that meant most to her to me most say. She was my mother, I her child. Could ten thousand priests have made us more? Do you curse the bloom of the heather wild? Do you trample the flowers and cry impure? Do you shun the bird's song's silver shower? Does their music arouse your curling scorn that none but God blessed them? The whitest flower, the purest song, were but bastard born. This is my sin, I was born of her. This is my crime, that I reverence deep. God, that her pale corpse may not stir, press closer down on her lids, the sleep. Would you have me hate her, me who knew that the gentlest soul in the world looked there, out of the grey eyes that pitied you, even while you cursed her, the long brown hair that waved from her forehead has brushed my cheek when her soft lips have drunk up my salt of grief and the voice whose echo you hate would speak the hush of pity and love's relief and those still hands that are folded now have touched my sorrows for years away would you have me question her whence and how the love light streamed from her heart's deep ray do you question the sun that it gives its gold? Do you scowl at the cloud when it pours its rain till the fields that were withered and burnt and old are fresh and tender and young again? Do you search the source of the breeze that sweeps the rush of fever from the tortured brain? Do you ask whence the perfume that round you creeps when your soul is wrought to the quick with pain? She was my sun, my dew, my air. The highest, the purest, the holiest place was the shade of her beautiful hair. Love was all that I knew on her breast. Would you have me forget? Or remembering say that her love had bloomed from hell? Then blessed be hell, and let heaven sing te deum laudamus until it swell, and ring and roll to the utterest earth that the damned are free, since out of sin came the whiteness the shamed all ransomed worth, till God opened the gates, saying, Enter in. What? In the face of the witness I bear to her measureless love and her purity, still of your hate would you make me share, despising that she gave life to me? You would have me stand at her helpless grave, to dig through its earth with a venomed dart. This is honour, and right, and brave, to fling a stone at her pulseless heart. This is virtue, to blast the lips speechless beneath the silence dread, to lash with slander's scorpion wings the voiceless, defenceless, helpless dead. God, I turn to an adder now, back upon you I hurl your scorn, bind the scarlet upon your brow, ye it is who are bastard born. Touch me not, these hands of mine despise your fairness, the lepers white, tanned and hardened and black with grime, they are clean beside your souls to-night. Basely born, tis ye are base, ye who would guerdon holy trust with slavish law to a tyrant race, to sow the earth with the seed of lust. Base, by heaven, 
crate of peace, when your garments are red with the stain of wars, reeling with passion's mad release by your sickly gaslight, damn the stars. Blurred with wine ye behold the snow, smirched with the foulness that blots within. What of purity can ye know, ye tenfold children of hell and sin? Ye to judge her, ye to cast the stone of wrath from your house of glass. Know ye the law that ye dare to blast the bell of gold with your clanging brass? Know ye the harvest that reapers reap, who drop in the furrow the seeds of scorn? Out of this anguish ye harrow deep, ripens the sentence, ye bastard born. I, sin begotten, hear the curse, not mine, not hers, but the fatal law. Who bids one suffer shall suffer worse, who scourges himself shall be scourged raw. For the thoughts ye think, and the deeds ye do, move on and on till the flood is high, and the dread dam bursts, and the waves roll through, hurling a cataract's dirge to the sky. Tonight ye are deaf to the beggar's prayer, tomorrow the thieves shall batter your wall. Ye shall feel the weight of a starved child's care, when your warders under the mob's feet fall. Tis the roar of the whirlwind ye invoke, when ye scatter the wind of your brother's moans. Tis the red of your hate on your own head broke, when the blood of the murdered splatters the stones. Hark ye, out of the reeking slums, thick with the fetid stench of crime, boiling up through the sickening scums, bubbles that burst through the crimson wine. Voices burst with terrible sound, crying the truth your dull souls never saw. We are your sentence, the wheel turns round, the bastard spawn of your bastard law. This is bastard, that man should say how love shall love, and how life shall live. Setting a tablet to groove God's way, measuring how the divine shall give. O oh, evil heart, ye have maddened me, that I should interpret the voice of God. Quiet, quiet, O oh, angered sea, quiet, I go to her blessed sod. Mother, mother, I come to you, down in your grass as I press my face. Under the kiss of their cold, pure dew, I may dream as I lie in the dear old place. Mother, sweet mother, take me back into the bosom from whence I came. Take me away from the cruel rack, take me out of the parching flame. Fold me again with your beautiful hair, speak to this terrible heaving sea. Over me pour the soothing prayer, the words of the love child of Galilee. Peace, be still, still I could but hear. Softly I listen, O oh, fierce heart cease. Softly I breathe, not low, in my ear. Mother, mother, I heard you. Peace. Enterprise, Kansas, January. 1891. End of Bastard Born. Recording by Lucy Perry in Bath on February the 23rd, 2009. Section 12 of Selected Works, Poems by Walter Ian de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina Heim from Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare This hymn was written at the request of a Christian science friend who proposed to set it to music. It did not represent my beliefs either then or since, but rather what I wish might be my beliefs, had I not an inexorable capacity for seeing things as they are, a vast scheme of mutual murder with no justice anywhere and no God in the soul or out of it. I am at peace. No storm can ever touch me. On my clear heights the sunshine only falls. Far, far below glides the phantom voice of sorrows in the peace lifted light the silence only calls ah soul ascend the mountain way a pleading bears to the height whereon the blessed have trod lay down the burden stanch the heart's sad bleeding be ye at peace for know that ye are god not long the way, not far, in a dim heaven, in the locked self, seek ye the guiding star. Clear shine its rays, illumining the shadow, there, where God is, there too, O souls, ye are. Ye are at one, and bound in him forever, even as the wave is bound in the great sea, never to drift beyond. Below him never, whole as God is, so even so are ye. End of time.
Section 13 of Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. You and I, from Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. You and I. In the sere brown weather, when clouds hang thick in the frowning sky, When rain tears drip on the bloomless heather, Unheeding the storm blasts, we'll walk together, And look to each other, you and I. You and I, when the clouds are shriven, To show the cliff broods of lightnings high, When over the ramparts, swift, thunder-driven rush the bolts of hate from a hell-lit heaven will smile at each other you and i you and i when the bolts are falling the hot air torn with the earth's wild cries will lean through the darkness where death is calling will search through the shadows where night is palling and find the light in each other's eyes you and I, when black sheets of water drench and tear us and drown our breath below this laughter of hell's own daughter, above the smoke of the storm-girt slaughter, we'll hear each other and gleam at death. You and I, in the gray night dying, when over the east land the dawn beams fly, down in the groans, in the low, faint crying, Down where the thick blood is blackly lying, We'll reach out our weak arms, You and I. You and I in the cold white weather, When over our corpses the pale lights lie, We'll rest at last from the dread endeavor, Press to each other, for parting never, our dead lips together, you and I. You and I, when the years in flowing have left us behind with all things that die, with the rot of our bones shall give soil for growing the loves of the future, made sweet for blowing by the dew of the kiss of a last goodbye. End of You and I Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 14 of Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Toast of Despair From Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare we have cried, and the gods are silent. We have trusted, and been betrayed. We have loved, and the fruit was ashes. We have given, the gift was weighed. We know that the heavens are empty, that friendship and love are names, that truth is an ashen cinder, the end of life's burnt-out flames. Vainly and long have we waited through the night of the human roar for a single song on the harp of hope or a ray from a daylit shore. Songs, I come floating, marvelous sweet, and bow-dyed flashes gleam. But the sweets are lies, and the weary feet run after a marsh-light beam. In the hour of our need the song departs, and the sea-moans of sorrow swell. The siren mocks with a gurgling laugh that is drowned in the deep death knell. The light we chased with our stumbling feet as the goal of happier years swings high and low and vanishes. The bow dies were of our tears. 
God is a lie, and faith is a lie, and a tenfold lie is love. Life is a problem without a why, and never a thing to prove. It adds and subtracts and multiplies, and divides without aim or end. Its answers all false, though false named true. Wife, husband, lover, friend. We know it now, and we care no more. What matters life or death? We tiny insects emerge from earth, suffer, and yield our breath. Like ants we crawl on our brief sand hill, dreaming of mighty things. Lo, they crunch like shells in the ocean's wrath, in the rush of time's awful wings. The sun smiles gold, and the planets white, and a billion stars smile still. Yet fierce as we are, each wheels towards death and cannot stay his will. Then build, ye fools, your mighty things, that time shall set at naught. Grow warm with this song the sweet lie sings, and the false bow your tears have wrought. For us, a truce to God's loves and hopes, and a pledge to fire and wave, a swifter whirl to the dance of death, and a loud huzzah for the grave. End of The Toast of Despair Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 15 of Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Memoriam, to Dyer D. Lum, from Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. Great, silent heart, these barren drops of grief are not for you, attained unto your rest. This sterile salt upon the withered leaf of love is mine. Mine the dark burial guest. Far, far within that deep, untroubled sea We watch together, walking on the sands. Your soul has melted, painless, silent, free. Mine the wrung heart, mine the clasped, useless hands into the whirl of life where none remember i bear your image ever unforgot the whippoorwill still wailing in december cries the same cry cries cries and ceases not the future years with all their waves of faces roll shoreward singing the great undertone yours is not there in the old, well-loved places I look and pass and watch the sea alone. Alone among the gleaming white seashore, the sea spume spraying thick around my head. Through all the beat of waves and wind that roar, I go, remembering that you are dead. That you are dead, and nowhere is there one like unto you, And nowhere love leaps death, And nowhere may the broken race be run, Nowhere unsealed the seal that none gainsayeth. Yet in my ear that deep, sweet undertone Grows deeper, sweeter, solemner to me, Dreaming your dreams, watching the light that shone so whitely to you, yonder on the sea. Your voice is there, there in the great life sound. Your eyes are there, out there, within the light. Your heart, 
within the pulsing race heart drowned beats in the immortality of right o oh, life i love you for the love of him who showed me all your glory and your pain unto nirvana so the deep tones sing and there and there we shall be one again end of immemorium to dyer d lum recording by rhonda fetterman Section 16 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltaire de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Out of the Darkness, from Selected Works, Poems by Voltaire de Clare. Who am I? Only one of the commonest common people only a worked-out body, a shriveled and withered soul. What right have I to sing, then? None, and I do not, I cannot. Why ruin the rhythm and rhyme of the great world's songs with moaning? I know not, nor why whistles must shriek, wheels ceaselessly mutter nor why all I touch turns to clanging and clashing and discord. I know not. I know only this. I was born to this. Live in it hourly. Go round with it, hum with it, curse with it, would laugh with it, had it laughter. It is my breath, and that breath goes outward from me in moaning. Oh, you up there i have heard you i am god's image defaced in heaven reward awaits me hereafter i shall be perfect ages you've sung that song but what is it to me think you if you heard down here in the smoke and the smut in the smear and the awful in the dust, in the mire, in the grime, and in the slime, in the hideous darkness. How the wheels turn your song into sounds of horror and loathing and cursing. The offer of lust, the sneer of contempt and acceptance, thieves' whispers, the laugh of the gambler, the suicide's gasp, the yell of the drunkard. If you heard them down here, you would cry, The reward of such is damnation. If you heard them, I say, Your song of rewarded hereafter would fail. You, too, with your science, your titles, your books, and your long explanations, that tell me how I am to come up out of the dust of the cycles, out of the sands of the sea, out of the unknown primeval forests, out of the growth of the world have become the bud and the promise. Out of the race of the beasts have arisen, proud and triumphant. You, if you knew how your words rumble round in the wheels of labor, if you knew how my hammering heart beats, liar, liar, you lie. Out of all buds of the earth we are most blasted and blighted. What beast of all the beasts is not prouder and freer than we? You, too, who sing in the high words of the glory of man universal, the beauty of sacrifice, debt of the future, the present immortal, the glory of use, absorption by death of the being in being. You, if you knew what jargon it makes down here, would be quiet. Oh, is there no one to find or to speak a meaning to me, to me as I am, the hard, the ignorant, 
withered-souled worker. To me, upon whom God and science alike have stamped failure. To me, who know nothing but labor, nothing but sweat, dirt, and sorrow. To me, whom you scorn and despise, you up there who sing while I moan. To me as I am, for me as I am, not dying, but living, not my future, my present, my body, my needs, my desires. Is there no one in the midst of this rushing of phantoms, of gods, of science, of logic, of philosophy, morals, religion, economy, all this that helps not, all these ghosts at whose altars you worship, these ponderous, marrowless fictions, is there no one who thinks, is there nothing to help this dull moaning me? End of Out of the Darkness Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 17 of Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary Wollstonecraft, from Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. The dust of a hundred years is on thy breast and thy day and thy night of tears are centering rest. Thou to whom joy was dumb, life a broken rhyme, lo, thy smiling time is come, and our weeping time. Thou who hast sponge and myrrh and a bitter cross, smile, for the day is here that we know our loss loss of thine undone deed, thy unfinished song, the unspoken word for our need, the unrighted wrong. Smile, for we weep, we weep for the unsoothed pain, the unbound wound burned deep that we might gain. Mother of sorrowful eyes in the dead old days, Mother of many sighs, of pain-shod ways, Mother of resolute feet through all of the thorns, Mother soul strong, soul sweet, Lo, after storms have broken and beat thy dust for a hundred years, Thy memory is made just, and the just man hears, Thy children kneel and repeat, Though dust be dust, though sod and coffin and sheet and moth and rust have folded and molded and pressed, yet they cannot kill. In the heart of the world at rest, she liveth still. End of Mary Wollstonecraft Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 18 of Selected Works, Poems, by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gods and the People, from Selected Works, Poems, by Voltairine de Clare. What have you done, O oh skies, that the millions should kneel to you? Why should they lift wet eyes, grateful with human dew? Why should they clasp their hands and bow at thy shrines, O oh heaven, thanking thy high commands for the mercies that thou hast given? What have those mercies been, O oh thou who art called the good? Who trod through a world of sin, and stood where the felon stood? What is that wondrous peace vouchsafed to the child of dust, 
for whom all doubt shall cease in the light of thy perfect trust. How hast thou heard their prayers, smoking up from the bleeding sod, who, crushed by their weight of cares, cried up to thee, Most High God? Where the swamps of humanity sicken, read the answer in dumb white scars. You, skies, gave the sore and the stricken the light of your far-off stars. The children who plead are driven shelterless through the street, receiving the mercy of heaven, hard frozen in glittering sleet. The women who prayed for pity, who called on the saving name, through the walks of your merciless city are crying the rent of shame. The starving, who gazed on the plenty in which they might not share, have died in their hunger, rent by the anguish of unheard prayer. The weary, who plead for remission, for a moment only, release, have sunk with unheeded petition. This the Christ pledged peace. These are the mercies of heaven. These are the answer of God to the prayers of the agony shriven from the paths where the millions plod. The silent scorn of the sightless, the callous ear of the deaf, the wrath of might to the mightless, the shroud and the mourning sheaf. Light to behold their squalor, breath to draw in life's pain. Voices to plead and call for heaven's help, hearts to bleed in vain. What have you done, O church, that the weary should bless your name, should come with faith's holy torch to light up your altered fame? Why should they kiss the folds of the garment of your high priest, or bow to the chalice? that holds the wine of your sacred feast. Have you blown out the breath of their sighs? Have you strengthened the weak, the ill? Have you wiped the dark tears from their eyes, and bade their sobbings be still? Have you touched? Have you known? Have you felt? Have you bent? and softly smiled in the face of the woman who dwelt in lewdness to feed her child? Have you heard the cry in the night, going up from the outraged heart, masked from the social sight by the cloak that but angered the smart? Have you heard the children's moan by the light of the skies denied? Answer! O walls of stone, in the name of your crucified! Out of the clay of their heartbreak, from the red dew of its sod, you have mortared your brick for Christ's sake, and reared a palace to God. Your painters have dipped their brushes in the tears and the blood of the race whom, living, your dark frown crushes, and limbed a dead Saviour's face. You have seized in the name of God the child's crust from famine's dole. You have taken the price of its body, and sung a mass for its soul. You have smiled on the man who, deceiving, paid exemption to ease your wrath. You have cursed the poor fool who believed him, though her body lay prone in your path. You have laid the seal on the lip, you have bid us to be content, to bow neath our master's whip, and give thanks for the scourge heaven sent. These, O oh church, are your thanks, these are the fruits without flaw, that flow from the chosen ranks, who keep in your perfect law. Doors hard locked on the homeless, stained glass windows for bread. On the living, the law of dumbness, and the law of need, for the dead. Better the dead, who not needing, go down to the vaults of the earth, than the living, 
whose hearts lie bleeding, crushed by you at their very birth. What have you done, O State, that the toilers should shout your ways, should light up the fires of their hate, if a traitor should dare dispraise? How do you guard the trust that the people repose in you? Do you keep to the law of the just, and hold to the changeless true? What do you mean when you say, the home of the free and brave? How free are your people, pray? Have you no such thing as a slave? What are the lauded rights, broad sealed by your sovereign grace? What are the love-feeding sights you yield to your subject race? The rights, ah, the right to toil that another idol may reap, the right to make fruitful the soil and a meagre pittance to keep, the right of a woman to own her body spotlessly pure and starve in the street alone, the right of the wronged to endure, the right of the slave to his yoke, the right of the hungry to pray, the right of the toiler to vote for the master who buys his day. You have sold the sun and the air, you have dealt in the price of blood, you have taken the lion's share while the lion is fierce for food. You have laid the load of the strong on the helpless, the young, the weak. You have trod out the purple of wrong. Beware where its wrath shall wreak. Let the voice of the people be heard. Oh! You strangled it with your rope, denied the last dying word while your trap and your gallows spoke. But a thousand voices rise where the words of the martyr fell. The seed springs fast to the skies, watered deep from that bloody well. Hark! Low down, you will hear the storm in the underground. Listen, tyrants, and fear, quake at that muffled sound. Heavens that mocked our dust, smile on in your pitiless blue. Silent as you are to us, so silent are we to you. Churches that scourged our brains, priests that locked fast our hands, we planted the torch in your chains, now gather the burning brands. States that have given us law when we asked for the right to earn bread, the sword that Damocles saw by a hair swings over your head. What ye have sown ye shall reap, teardrops and blood and hate. Gaunt gather before your seat, and knock at your palace gate. There are murderers on your thrones, there are thieves in your justice halls. White leprosy cancers their stones, and gnaws at their worm-eaten walls. And the hand of Belshazzar's feast writes over in flaming light. Thought's kingdom no more to the priest nor the law of right unto might. End of The Gods and the People Recording by Ruth Golding Section 19 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltaire de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John P. Altgeld, from Selected Works, Poems by Voltaire de Clare After an incarceration of six long years in Joliet State Prison for an act of which they were entirely innocent, namely the throwing of the Haymarket bomb in Chicago, May 4, 1886, Oscar Nieb, Michael Schwab, and Samuel Fielden were liberated by Governor Altgeld, who thus sacrificed his political career 
to an act of justice. There was a tableau. Liberty's clear light shone never on a braver scene than that. Here was a prison. There a man who sat high in the halls of state. Beyond the might of ignorance and mobs whose hireling press yells at their bidding like the slaver's hounds, ready with coarse caprice to curse or bless, to make or unmake rulers. Lo, there sounds a grating of the doors, and three poor men, helpless and hated, having naught to give, come from their long-sealed tomb. Look up and live, and thank this man that they are free again. And he, to all the world this man dares say, Curse as you will, I have been just this day. End of John P. Altgeld Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 20 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cry of the Unfit From Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare the gods have left us, the creeds have crumbled, there are none to pity and none to care. Our fellows have crushed us where we have stumbled, they have made of our bodies a bleeding stare. Loud rang the bells in the Christmas steeples, we heard them ring through the bitter morn. The promise of old to the weary peoples came floating sweetly. Christ is born. But the words were mocking, sorely mocking, as we sought the sky through our freezing tears. We children who've hung the Christmas stocking and found it empty two thousand years. No, there is naught in the old creed for us. Love and peace are to those who win. To them the delight of the golden chorus, To us the hunger and shame and sin. Why then live on, since our lives are fruitless, Since peace is certain and death is rest, Since our masters tell us the strife is bootless, And nature scorns her unwelcome guest? You who have climbed on our aching bodies, You who have thought because we have toiled, Priests of the creed of a newer goddess, Searchers in depths where the past was foiled, Speak in the name of the faith that you cherish, Give us the truth, we have bought it with woe. Must we forever thus worthily perish? burned in the desert and lost in the snow, trampled, forsaken, foredoomed, and forgotten, helplessly tossed like the leaf in the storm, bred for the shambles with curses begotten, useless to all save the rotting grave worm. Give us some anchor to stay our mad drifting. Give, for your own sakes, for lo, where our blood a red tide to drown you is steadily lifting. Help, or you die in the terrible flood. End of The Cry of the Unfit Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 21 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. In Memoriam to General M. M. Trumbull. From Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. 
no man better than General Trumbull defended my martyred comrades in Chicago. Back to thy breast, O mother, turns thy child. He whom thou garmentedst in steel of truth, and sent forth strong in the glad heart of youth, to sing the wakening song in ears beguiled by tyrants' promises and flatterers' smiles. These searched his eyes, and knew nor threats nor wiles might shake the steady stars within their blue, nor win one truckling word from off those lips. No, not for gold nor praise, nor aught men do, to dash the sun of honor with eclipse. O oh, Mother Liberty, those eyes are dark, and the brave lips are white and cold and dumb. But fair in other souls, through time to come, fanned by the breath glows the immortal spark. Philadelphia, May 1894 End of In Memoriam to General M. M. Trumbull Section 22 of Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wandering Jew From Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare Go on, thou shalt go on till I come. Pale, ghostly vision from the coffined years, Planting thy cross with thy world-wandering feet, Stern watcher through the centuries storm and beat. In those sad eyes, between those grooves of tears, Those eyes like caves where sunlight never dwells, And stars but dimly shine, Stand sentinels that watch with patient hope, through weary days, that somewhere, sometime, he indeed may come, and thou at last find thee a resting place, blast-driven leaf of man within the tomb. Ay, they have cursed thee with the bitter curse, and driven thee with scourges o'er the world. Tyrants have crushed thee, Ignorance has hurled its black anathema, but death's pale hearse that bore them graveward passed them silently, and vainly didst thou stretch thy hand and cry, Take me instead. Not yet for thee the time, not yet, not yet. Thy bruised and mangled limbs must still drag on still feed the vulture, crime, with bleeding flesh, till rust its steel beak dims. Ay, till he come, he, freedom, justice, peace, till then shalt thou cry warning through the earth, unheeding pain, untouched by death and birth, proclaiming, Woe, 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 till men shall cease to seek for Christ within the senseless skies, and joyous find him in each other's eyes. Then shall be builded such a tomb for thee, shall beggar kings, as diamonds outshine do. The universal heart of man shall be the sacred urn of the accursed Jew. End of The Wandering Jew. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 23 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry. The Feast of Vultures, from Selected Works, Poems, by Volturine de Clare. As the three anarchists, Valiant, Henry, and Caserio, were led to their several executions, a voice from the prison cried loudly, Viva la anarchie! Through watch and ward the cry escaped, and no man owned the voice, 
but the cry is still resounding through the world. A moan in the gloam in the air peaks heard, the bird of omen, the wild fierce bird. A flight in the night, like a whiz of light, arrowy winging before the storm, far away flinging, the whistling singing, white curdled drops wind blown and warm, from its beating, flapping, thunderous wings, crashing and clapping, the split night swings and rocks and totters, bled of its levin and reels and mutters a curse to heaven. Reels and mutters and rolls and dies with a wild light streak in its black blind eyes. Far, far, far through the red mad morn, like a hurtling star through the air upborne, the herald singer, the terror bringer, speeds and behind through the cloud rags torn, gather and wheel a million wings, clanging as iron where the hammer rings. The whipped sky shivers, the white gate shakes, the rip throne quivers, the dumb god wakes and feels in his heart the taloned stings, the dead bodies hurled from beaks for slings. Ruin, ruin, the whirlwind cries, and it leaps at his throat and tears his eyes. Death for death as ye long have dealt, the heads of your victims your heads shall pelt, the blood ye wrung to get drunk upon. Drink and be poisoned, on, herald, on. Behold, behold, how a moan is grown, a cry hurled high against a scaffold's joist, the voice of defiance, the loud wild voice. Whirled through the world, a smoke wreath curled, breath round hot kisses around a fire. See the ground hisses with curses and glisses, with red streaming blood clots of long frozen ire. Waked by the flying wild voice as it passes, groaning and crying, the surge of the masses rolls and flashes. With thunderous roar, seams and lashes, the livid shore, seams and lashes and crunches and beats, and drags a ragged wall to its howling retreats. Swift, 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 thwart the blood rains fall, through the fire-shot rift of the broken wall. The prophet crying, the storm strong sighing, flies, and from under night's lifted pall, swarming menace ten million darts, uplifting fragments of human shrouds. Ah, white teeth chatter and dumb jaws fall, while winged fire scatter till gloom gulfs all, save the boom of the cannon that storm the forts, that the people bombard with their comrades' hearts. Vengeance, vengeance, the voices scream, and the vulture pinions whirl and stream. Knife for knife as ye long have dealt, the edge ye wetted for us be felt. Ye chopper of necks on your own, your own, bear it, coward, on, prophet, on. Behold how high rolls a prison cry. Philadelphia, August, 1894 End of the Feast of Vultures Recording by Lucy Perry In Bath on March 23, 2009section 24 of selected works poems by valterine de Clare. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the suicide's defense from selected works poems by valterine de Clare. to say in my defense defense of what Defence to whom? And why defence at all? Have I wronged any? Let that one accuse. Some priest there mutters, I have outraged God. Let God then try me, and let none dare judge himself as fit to put heaven's ermine on. Again I say, let the wronged one accuse. I, silence, there is none to answer me. And whom could I, a homeless, friendless tramp, to whom all doors are shut, all hearts are locked, all hands withheld, whom could I wrong, indeed, by taking that which benefited none and menaced all? I, since ye will it so, know then your risk. But mark, tis not defence, tis accusation that I hurl at you. See to it that ye prepare your own defence. My life, I say, is an eternal threat to you and yours, and therefore it were well to have forborne 
your unasked services. And why? Because I hate you. Every drop of blood that circles in your plethoric veins was wrung from out the gaunt and sapless trunks of men like me, who in your cursed mills were crushed like grapes within the wine-press ground. To us ye leave the empty skin of life, the heart of it, the sweet of it, ye poor to feed your dogs and mistresses withal. Your mistresses, our daughters, bought for bread to grace the flesh that once was father's arms. Yes, I accuse you that ye murdered me. Ye killed the man, and this that speaks to you is but the beast that ye have made of me. What, is it life to creep and crawl and beg and slink for shelter where rats congregate? And for one's ideal dream of a fat meal? Is it then life to group like pigs in styes and bury decency in common filth? Because forsooth your income must be made, though human flesh rot in your plague-rid dens. Is it then life? to wait another's nod for leave to turn yourself to gold for him. Would it be life to you? And was I less than you? Was I not born with hopes and dreams and pains and passions even as were you? But these ye have denied. Ye seized the earth, though it was none of yours, and said, here on shall none rest, walk or work, till first to me ye render tribute. Every art of man, born to make light of the burdens of the world, ye also seized, and made a tenfold curse to crush the man beneath the thing he made. Houses, machines, and lands, all, all are yours, and us, you do not need. When we ask work, ye shake your heads. Homes, ye evict us. Bread, here, officer, this fellow's begging. Jail's the place for him. After the stripes, what's next? Poison, I took it. Now you say twas sin to take this life which troubled you so much. Sin to escape insult, starvation, brands of felony, inflicted for the crime of asking food. Ye hypocrites! Within your secret hearts the sin is that I failed. Because I failed ye judge me to the stripes, and the hard toil denied when I was free. So be it. But beware. A prison sells an evil bed to grow morality. Black swamps breed black miasms. Sickly soils yield poison fruit. Snakes warm to life will sting. This time I was content to go alone. Perchance the next I shall not be so kind. End of The Suicide's Defense Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 25 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Joseph Nagy A Novel of Color from Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare Chapter 1 Chipmunks three sat on a tree, and they were as green as green could be. They cracked nuts early, they cracked nuts late, and chirruped and chirruped and ate and ate. Tis a pity of chipmunks without nuts, and a gnawing hunger in their guts. But they should be wise like you and me, and color themselves to suit the tree. Achi, achi! 
Achi achi. Gay chaps are we, we chipmunks three. An elephant white in sorry plight, hungry and dirty and sad bedite, straggled one day on the nutting ground. Lo, chattered the chipmunks, our chance is found. Behold the beast's color, were he as we? Green and sleek and not full were he. But the beast is big and the beast is white, and his skin full of emptiness serves him right. Achi achi, achi achi. Let us sit on him, sit on him, chipmunks three. Chapter 2. Three chipmunks, green, right, gay, were seen, to leap on the beast his brows between. They munched at his ears and chiffered his chin, and sat and sat and sat on him. Not a single available spot of hide, where a well-sleeked chipmunk could sit with pride, but was chipped and chipped and chip chip monked, till aught but an elephant must have flunked. Achi, 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 achi. What a ride we're having, we chipmunks three. Chapter 3. Burf! Chapter 4. What was it blue? A hue, a hue. Three green chipmunks have all turned blue. The elephant smiles a peaceful smile, and lifts off a tree trunk sans haste or guile. Seize him, seize him, he's stealing our tree. We're undone, undone, shrieked the chipmunks three. The elephant calmly upraised his trunk, and said, Did I hear a green chipmunk? Achi, 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 achu! Chippy, you're blue, so are you, so are you! End of A Novel of Color. Recording by Joseph Nagy of www.josephnagy.com. That's J O Z E F N A G Y. End of Selected Works. Poems by Voltairine de Clare. Section 26 of Selected Works. Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or uh, to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Germinal from Selected Works Poems by Votarine de Clare Germinal, the field of Mars is ploughing, and hard the still that cuts, and hot the breath of the great oxen straining flanks and bowing beneath his goad who guides the share of death germinal the dragon's teeth are sowing and stern and white the sower flings the seed he shall not gather though full swift the growing straight down death pharaoh treads and does not heed germinal the helmet heads are springing far up the field of Mars in gleaming files. With the wide ward notes, the bursting earth is ringing. Within his grave, the sower sleeps and smiles. End of a Germinal. Recording by Sergio Baldelli. Rome, February 2009. Section 27 of Selected Works Poems by Voturine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Light upon Waldheim from Selected Works Poems by Voturine de Clare the figure on the monument over the grave of the Chicago martyrs in Waldheim Cemetery is a warrior woman, dropping with her left hand a crown upon the forehead of a fallen man just past his agony, and with her right drawing a dagger from her bosom. Light upon Waldheim, and the earth is grey, a bitter wind is driving from the north. The stone is cold, and the strange cold whispers say, What do ye hear with death? Go forth, go forth. Is this thy word, O mother, with the stern eyes, crowning thy dead with the stone caressing touch? May we not weep o'er him that martyred lies, slain our name, 
for that he loved us much may we not linger till the day is broad nay none are stirring in this stinging dawn none but poor wretches that make no moan to god what use are these o thou with dagger drawn go forth go forth stand not to weep for these till wickened with your whipping like the snow ye melt dissolving in a coward peace light upon wardheim brother let us go end of light upon wardheim recording by sergio baldelli rome march 2009Section 28 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Love's Compensation, from Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. I went before God, and he said, what fruit of the life I gave? Father, I said, it is dead, and nothing grows on the grave. Wroth was the Lord and stern. Hadst thou not to answer me? Shall the fruitless root not burn, and be wasted utterly? Father, I said, forgive, for thou knowest what I have done that another's life might live, mine turned to a barren stone. But the father of life sent fire, and burned the root in the grave, and the pain in my heart is dire, for the thing that I could not save. For the thing it was laid on me, by the Lord of life to bring, fruit of the ungrown tree, that died for no watering. Another has gone to God, and his fruit has pleased him well, for he sitteth high while I plod the dry ways down towards hell. Though thou knowest, thou knowest, Lord, whose tears made that fruit's root wet, yet thou drivest me forth with a sword, and thy guards by the gate are set. Thou wilt give me up to the fire, and none shall deliver me, for I followed my heart's desire, and I labored not for thee. I labored for him thou hast set on thy right hand high and fair. Thou lovest him, Lord, and yet t'was my love won him there. But this is the thing that hath been, hath been since the world began, that love against self must sin, and a woman die for a man. And this is the thing that shall be, shall be till the whole world die. Kismet, my doom is on me. Why murmur, since I am I? End of Love's Compensation Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 29 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Road Builders From Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare I saw them toiling in the blistering sun, their dull, dark faces leaning toward the stone, their knotted fingers grasping the rude tools, their rounded shoulders narrowing in their chest, the sweat drops dripping in great, painful beads. I saw one fall, his forehead on the rock, the helpless hand still clutching at the spade, the slack mouth full of earth. 
and he was dead. His comrades gently turned his face until the fierce sun glittered hard upon his eyes, wide open, staring at the cruel sky. The blood yet ran upon the jagged stone, but it was ended. He was quite, quite dead, driven to death beneath the burning sun, driven to death upon the road he built. He was no hero, he a poor black man, taking the will of God and asking naught. Think of him thus, when next your horse's feet strike out the flint spark from the gleaming road. Think that for this, this common thing, the road, a human creature died. Tis a blood gift to an o'er-reaching world that does not thank. Ignorant, mean, and soulless was he? Well, still human, and you drive upon his corpse. End of The Road Builders Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 30 of Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Angio Leo From Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare We are the souls that crept and cried in the days when they tortured men. His was the spirit that walked erect and met the beast in its den. Ours are the eyes that were dim with tears for the thing they shrunk to see. His was the glance that was crystal keen with the light that makes men free. Ours are the hands that were wrung in pain, in helpless pain and shame. His was the resolute hand that struck, steady and keen to its aim. Ours are the lips that quivered with rage, that cursed and prayed in a breath. His was the mouth that opened but once to speak from the throat of death. Assassin, assassin, the world cries out with a shake of its doddered head. Germinal rings back the grave where lies the dead that is not dead. Germinal, germinal, sings the wind that is driving before the storm. Few are the drops that have fallen yet, scattered but red and warm. Germinal, germinal, sings the fields where furrows of men are plowed. Ye shall gather a harvest over rich when the ear at the full is bowed. Springing, springing at every breath, the word of invincible strife, the word of the dead, that is calling loud the battle ranks of life. For these are not the dead that live, though the earth upon them lie, but the doers of deeds of the night of the dead, they are the live that die. End of Angia Leo Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 31 of Selected Works Poems by Walterine de Clare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mina Abe et Whale from Selected Works Poems by Walterine de Clare Comrades, what matter the watch night tells that a new year comes or goes? What to us are the crashing bells that clang out the centuries close? What to us is the gala dress, the whirl of the dancing feet, the glitter and blare in the laughing press, and din of Mary Street. Do we not know that our brothers die in the cold and dark tonight? Shelterless faces turn towards the sky, 
will not see the new year's light wandering children lonely lost drift away on the human sea while the prize of their lives in a glass is tossed and drunk in a revelry ah know we not in their feasting halls where the loud laugh echoes again that brick and stone in the mortared walls are bones of murdered men slowly murdered by day and day the beauty and strength are reft till the man is sapped and sucked away and a human rind is left a human rind with old thin hair and old thin voice to pray for arms in the bitter winter air a knife at his heart always and pure in heart are impure in flesh for the cost of a little food lo when the gleaner of time shall thresh let these be accounted good for these are they who in bitter blame eat the bread whose salt is sin whose bosoms are burned with scarlet shame till their heart are seared within the cowardly jest of a hundred years will be thrown where they pass to night to callous for hate and to dry for tears the saddest of human blight do we forget them these broken ones that are watched to night a set may we smile in the face of the ear that comes because we do not forget we do not forget the tramp on the track thrust out in the wind swept waste the curses of man upon his back and the curse of god in his face the stare in the eyes of the buried man face down in the fallen mine the despair of the child whose bare feet ran to tread out the rich men's wine the solemn light in the dying gaze of the babe at a empty breast the wax accusation the somber glaze of its frozen and rigid rest they are all in the smile that we turn to the east to welcome the century's dawn they are all in our greeting to night's high priest as we bid the old year be gone be gone and have done and go down and be dead deep drowned in your sea of tears we smile as you die for we weigh the red morn gleam of a hundred years that shall see the end of the age old wrong the reapers that have not sown the reapers of men with the sickle strong who gather but have not strown for the earth shall be his and the fruits thereof and to him the corn and wine who labors the hills with an even love and knows not thine and mine and the silk shall be to the hand that weaves the pearl to him who dives the home to the builder and all life sheaves to the builder of human lives and none go blind that another see or die that another live and none insult with a charity that is not theirs to give for each of his plenty shall freely share and take at another's hand equals breathing the common air and toiling the common land a dream a vision i what you will let it be to you as it seems of this nightmare real we have our fill tonight is for pleasant dreams dreams that shall waken the hope that sleeps and knock at each torpid heart till it beat drum tap and blood that creeps with the lion's spring up start for who are we to be bound and drowned in this river of human blood who are we to lie in a swound half sunk in the river's mud are we not they who delve and blast and hammer and build and burn without us not a nail made fast not a wheel in the world should turn must we the giant await the grace that is dealt by puny hand of him who sits in the feasting place while we his blind jest stand between the pillars may not so i if such things were true better were gaza again to show what the giant's rage may do but yet not this 
it were wiser far to enter the feasting hall and say to the masters these things are not for you alone but all and this shall be in the century that opes on our eyes tonight so here's to the struggle if it must be and to him who fights the fight and here's to the dauntless jubilant throat that loud to its comrades sings till over the earth shrills the mustering note and the world strikes signal rings end of ave et wail Section 32 of Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina. Marsh Bloom from Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare. 2. Gitano Brescott Requiem, requiem, requiem Blood red blossom of poison stem Broken for man Swam sung leafage in dungeon bloom Seeded bearer of royal doom What now is the path? What to thee is the island grave With desert wind and desolate wave Will they silence death? Can they weigh thee now with the heaviest stone? Can they lay out on thee with thee alone that hast conquered breath? Lo, it's finished, a man for a king. Mark you well who have done this thing. The flower has roots, bitter and rank, grow the things of the sea. Ye shall know what sap ran thick in the tree when ye pluck its fruits requiem 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 sleep on sleep on accursed of them who work our pain a wild marsh blossom shall blow again from the buried root in the slime of men on the day of the great red rain end of marsh bloom Section 33 of Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina. Written in Red from Selected Works, Poems by Walterine de Clare. To a living dead, in Mexico's trouble, written in red, their protest stands for the gods of the world to say. On the dooming wall, their borderless hands have blazoned a parison, and the pleading brands illumine the message. Seize the lands, open the prisons, and make men free. Flame out the living words of the dead, written in red. Gods of the world. Their mouths are dumb. Your guns have spoken, and they are dust. But the shrouded living, whose hearts were numb, have felt the beat of a wakening drum. Within them sounding the dead men's tongue, calling, smite off the ancient rust, have beheld, resurrected, the word of death, written in red. Bear it aloft, a roaring flame, Skyward aloft, where all may see. Slaves of the world are cast as the same. One is the immemorial shame. One is the struggle, and in one name. Manhood, we battle to set men free. And curse us the land. Burn the words of the dead, written in red. End of Written in Red Section 34 of Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Nameless, from Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. I thought that I heard a sound, a voice. Was there a voice that spoke? Or did I fancy? I must have dreamed, and have only now awoke. Again, what is it? I cannot see. Is there any one in the room? Those words. A minister come to pray my soul through the gates of gloom. That's kind of you, but what do you say? Do I shrink from death? Ah, no. I long for his terrible arms and the frost of his icy breath. There is rest for me on his stony breast. There is peace in his cold, cold heart. Ah, no, I fear not. My bosom's bare for the sting of his shadowy dart. Do you know what death means, sir, to such as I, the wanton, the wretch of the street, the trodden thing that you godly ones crush down as a worm neath your feet? It means the end of a ceaseless pain that none pity save those who bear. Dear death, draw near, lay your hands on mine, draw nearer my pillow share. You say that I wander, that I forget the stains on my guilty soul. I must turn to Christ with a trusting faith, and he will wash out the whole. Why didn't your Christ save my soul before from pollution's dark living grave? When I was honest and pure and good was the time for your Christ to save. I wasn't always an outcast, sir, to disgrace my sex and name. And it isn't from choice that these last five years I've been leading a life of shame. Why didn't your godly ones come to me ere my virtue was putrid, dead? If your Christ knew how hard I struggled, why did he make so dear honest bread? If I could only tell you how hard I tried, if I only had time to speak. But what does it matter? It's over now and I'm growing so weak, so weak. What is it? I didn't ask Christ, you say? Nay, sir, on my bended knees, in the streets I've prayed to him to send me work that I may not starve and freeze. On my knees I prayed, in the other days, that his merciful hand might save the man I loved and whose name I bore from the stain of a drunkard's grave. And I asked your Christ when I saw him die, only six poor feet to yield of his great wide earth for a burial place, and he gave me the potter's field. I followed John's corpse to a pauper's grave, in the aisles of eternal night, and the love of my life went down with the clods that buried him from my sight. I didn't think as I stood there then in the driving wind and sleet of my helpless self with my babe in arms, turned homeless in the street. I didn't think of the weary years, nor the pain that was yet to come. I could only think of those closed-shut lids and the dear lips sealed and dumb. I didn't remember the life he'd led, nor his last blood-curdling curse. I only thought I'd once taken him for better or for worse. That heart that I so often had pressed to mine lay pulseless, and cold and still, and a weary voidness was left to me that nothing might ever fill. Yes, he died of the tremens, 
you'll comfort me by saying his soul is lost. But where is the fiend who sold him rum, the price that his ruin cost? He's sitting today in a cushioned pew, a good Christian without flaw, along with the praetors of justice high and the deacons who make the law. When he dies, you will say the great white gates flew open to let him in, while my John is lying in mortal pain from his great unforgivable sin. Ah, John, dear John, I am faithful yet. All the love I had to give is yours in death as in life, dear John. And if somewhere again we live, you will know and forgive me. T'was for our child, you will pity, you will not blame, that to save our child I sold myself and drank the dregs of shame. I tried so hard to be honest, John, but where was the use to try? So many were willing to sell their toil, and oh, so few to buy. So few, so few, have felt, have seen God's love in the blue skies, though the ranks of the starving poor are filled with mournful, beseeching eyes. They are filled with eyes that implore, and haunt, and follow you through the years. Strange, suffering eyes that are always dry and heavy with unshed tears. What is it? Could I get no work at all? Sometimes. But, good sir, I pray. Would you care to preach for seventeen hours at thirty-five cents a day? It wasn't often I'd make that much for sewing without a fire. In dead of winter is fearful work, and your stiffened fingers tire. And your head swims round, and your shivering limbs grow numb with the cold. And, well, it doesn't seem half so awful, then, this selling yourself for gold. To me it didn't seem so bad as to you, in the generous heat, when I was forced in my mouth to hold my little one's freezing feet. The nobler self, like a delicate plant, dies fast in a pitiless hour, and the numbing cold of starvation's tooth has a terrible blasting power. I, and many a winter night, while you, in your well-warmed home, were teaching the love of Christ and God, I was forced in the streets to roam. Forced in the streets to roam all night with the babe on my shivering breast. And a minister's wife has refused me food or even a spot to rest. How long do you think your own mother, sir, would have led a virtuous life? If she had been left in the world like this, how long would your trusted wife have remained like the snow ere it falls to earth, to mix in the muddy street with the filth and the mire and the grime and the ooze ground in by the trampling feet? I tell you, sir, it's a terrible thing to judge of a woman's sin. When a tenement's rent is a higher price than her honest toil can win. No, don't talk of Christ any more to me. When my little one's dying head was laid on my bosom, I asked him then, for the last time, to send me bread. I prayed to him. Oh, so earnestly, and how did his answer come? The landlord knocked for his rent, and I, like your Christ, was dumb. I was dumb with despair, a dull blank despair, as I went out into the night. 
and I didn't know, nor I didn't care, if I did wrong or right. I sold myself for a glittering price. T'was too late. Little Charlie died. And I'm only waiting for death to come, that we may sleep side by side. Life hasn't mattered to me since then. All that I loved was gone. But your God of vengeance, perhaps, decreed that I, in my grief, live on. It is over now. I am almost gone. It is darker. I am nearly blind. Yes, I thank you for your intention, sir. I am sure it was very kind. No, your prayers would be useless. I asked for bread, and your Christ gave me a stone. I can leave this world as I've lived in it, in shame and in pain, alone. It isn't the dying who need God's help, it's the living who cry for aid. Don't expect to have virtuous death, my friend, when virtue's so underpaid. While virtue's so underpaid in life, and honor is sold so high, don't talk about Jesus' tender love, don't endeavor to help vice die. I am weak, so weak, and my voice, it fails. A faintness steals over me. O oh, John, dear John, and my little one, I am coming. Light, I see. End of Nameless Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 35 of Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Santa Guida, from Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare. Santa Aguida, where the torturer Canovas breathed his last. Santa Aguida, thou that wast accursed with presence of a demon dressed in man, blessed art thou, for on thy stones there ran the vampire blood from bitter torture nursed, along thy streets there flashed the lightning burst, delivered, flaming on from eye to eye, though lips said killed, and all thy gateways hearsed, in lying black, made mourning mockery. Blessed art thou, from thee went forth the cry, Vengeance yet loves, renunciation hates, and justice smites, the torturer shall die. Across his path the steel-nerved slayer waits, and both shall burn together, one in light of unconsuming hell and reddened night, and one with feet on hell and brow dawn raid, pure white. End of Santa Aguida. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 36 of Selected Works. Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. End Thou Too, from Selected Works, Poems by Voltairine de Clare The moonlight rolls down like a river, the silence streams out like a sea, and far where the eastern winds quiver, my farewell goes floating to thee. Like night when the sunset is fading, and starbeams troop up in the skies. Through a cold, dark, and lonely forever gleams the light of the poet's eyes. And sometimes when I'm weary, when the path is thorny and wild, 
I'll look back to the eyes in the twilight, back to the eyes that smiled, and pray that a wreath like a rainbow may slip from the beautiful past and crown me again with the sweet, strong love and keep me and hold me fast. For the way is not strewn with petals soft, it is covered with hearts that weep, and the wounds I tread touch a deeper source than you think it mine to keep. Down the years I shall move without you, yet ever must feel the blow that caused me a deeper pain to give than you will ever know. For the tears that dropped on my hands that night neath the mystical shining moon were a sacred dew consecrated there on the rose-altered heart of June. And the heart that beat against mine like a bird that is fluttering wounded sore, with its nest all broken, deserted, torn, will beat there forevermore. But the world moves on, and the piteous earth still groans in the monster pain, and the star that leads me points onward yet, though the red drops fall like rain. Ah, not to a blaze of light I go, nor shouts of a triumph train. I go down to kiss the dregs of woe, and drink up the cup of pain. And whether a scaffold or crucifix waits, neath the light of my silver star, I know and I care not, I only know I shall pause not, though it be far. Though a crucified life or an agonized death, though long or quick and sharp, I am firmly wrought in the endless thread of destiny's woof and warp. And I do not shrink, though a wave of pain sobs over me now and then, as I think of those saddest of all sad words, the pitiful might have been. It might have been, it is not to be, and the tones of your swan's farewell ring sadly, solemnly, deep to me, like the voice of a sobbing bell. I gather your petals and take them back to the dead heart under the dew, and crown it again with the red love bloom, for the dead are always true. But go not back to the sediment in the slime of the moaning sea. For a better world belongs to you and a better friend to me. End of End Thou Too Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 37 of Selected Works Poems by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Simonson. The Dirge of the Sea. From Selected Works. Poems by Voltairine de Clare. Come, come, I have waited long. My love is old, my arms are strong. I would woo thee now with the wave-kiss cold on thy pallid brow. Thou art mine, thou art mine, my very own. Thine ears shall hear my eternal moan. Always near thou art feel my lips, and the bathing tear where my sorrow drips. Thou, my king forever, behold thy throne, reign in thy majesty all alone. None, none wept for thee, nearing the verge of eternity. I, thy solemn dirge, will chant for I, wide as the wave merge into sky. I love thee, thou art my chosen own, thy heart like mine was cold as stone. Thine eyes could shine, 
like my blue waves fair, thy lips like wine curve to kisses rare. Hard as my waves were the eyes that shone, and the wine as deadly come love alone. Float, float on the swelling wave, long as the hearse wide the grave. Thy pall is a curse from the fading shore, a broken verse from a heart wrung sore. Life's streams wreck strown, ah, like my own, the words are low as a dying groan. The voice thrills so it might rouse thy breast, with pity's glow, wert thou like the rest. But thou, my hero, wert never known, to feel as a human thou stoodst alone. Down, down, behold the wrecks, I strew the deep with these human specks. No faith I keep with their moral trust, see how I heap their crumbling dust. I sneered in their faces my own, my own, as they knelt to pray when the ships went down. I flung my spray in their dying eyes and laughed at the way it drowned their cries. On the shore they heard the exultant tone and said, The sea laughs, ah, I laughed alone. Now, now we twain shall go, love locked, laughing so. The fools ye mocked with your tender eyes, the trusts ye rocked with your cradling lies. Even like these wretches, my own, my own, shall rot in clay or crumbled bone. Thou shalt hold thy way, day kissed and fair, where the wild waves play in the sun-thick air. My arms, my kiss, my tears, my moan, you shall know for I where we wander lone. Love, love, thou wert like to me, thy luring gaze rolled relentlessly. The marsh light blazed to some human soul, down the darkening maze to ruin's goal. Ah, how ye crushed them, my beautiful own, like whistled leaves around thee stone. Whirled the dead beliefs of each long-mourned life, here no one grieves, neither tears nor strife. Appeal to the sea where its wrecks are thrown, thou shalt stand in their midst and smile alone. Laugh, laugh, O form of light, death hides thy faithless sight. The flowing tides of thy heart are still, yet are wrecks thy brides, for it is my will. That that which on earth made thy heaven my own, may strew around thy eternal throne. The gurgling sound of the dying cry, the gushing wound of heart agony, were thy joy in life. Now the sea makes known thy realm in death, thy heaven alone. Years, years ye shall mix with me, ye shall grow a part of the laughing sea, of the moaning heart, of the glittered wave, of the sun gleams dart in the ocean grave. Fair, cold, and faithless wert thou my own, for that I love thy heart of stone. From the heights above to the depths below, where dread things move, there is naught can show a life so trustless. Proud be thy crown, ruthless like none, save the sea alone. End of the Dirge of the Sea Recording by Glenn Simonson in Omaha, Nebraska Section 38 of Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I Am, from Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. I Am, the ages on the ages roll. And what I am, I was, and I shall be, By slow growth filling higher destiny, And widening ever to the widening goal. I am the stone that slept, Down deep in me that old, old sleep Has left its centering trace. I am the plant that dreamed, And lo, still see that dream life dwelling on the human face. I slept, I dreamed, I wakened. I am man. The hut grows palaces, the depths breathe light, 
still on, forms pass, but form yields kinglier might. The singer, dying where his song began, in me yet lives, and yet again shall he unseal the lips of greater songs to be. For mine the thousand tongues of immortality. End of I Am Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 39 of Selected Works, Poems, by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Love's Ghost, from Selected Works, Poems, by Voltairine de Clare. Among the leaves and the rolls of moonlight, The moon which weaves lace on the road white, Among the winds and among the flowers, Our blithe feet wander, life is ours. Life is ours and life is loving, All our powers are locked in loving. Hearts and eyes and lips are moving With the ecstasy of loving. Ah, the roses, they are blooming, and the June air, throbbing, tuning, sings of love's eternal summer, chants of joy, life's only comer, and we clasp our hands together, singing in the warm, sweet weather, kissing, thrilling with caressing, all the sweet from love's rose pressing. Ah, so easy, earth is heaven, darkness shadows do not live. Like the rose our hearts are given, like the rose whose bloom is given to the sun-gold and the heaven, not because it wills or wishes, but because tis life to give. Dreary, dreary snow-filled darkness, heavy, weary, voiceless darkness, we have drifted, 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 you and I, far apart as snows and roses, sea and sky, we have drifted, drifted, Drifted far asunder. Any my lonely voice uplifted in sad wonder, Heavy with its own sad calls. All your love was of the summer, Born to die among the roses. Wither, scatter like the roses, Leaving me the grey-browed comer, With the ashes on his forehead And the winter in his hair, With the footsteps slow and solemn Going down the endless stair. Joy is gone, and you, my lover, gone in other ways to hover, Gone among the summer places, gone to seek for summer faces. Bright-faced joy was not for me, born among the snows and pines. Gray-faced sorrow was to be imaged in my mournful lines. Love, not born for cold and sorrow, only for the sweet sunshine, I shall keep your face forever hidden in this heart of mine. In its light one spot will brighten, keeping fair the sacred tomb. Like old moonlight it will whiten the inviolable room, like the moonlight it will whiten. Softly all the darkened room and the broken stalk may put forth memory's ghost of love's old bloom. End of Love's Ghost Section 40 of Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life or Death, from Selected Works, Poems by Valterine de Clare. A soul, half through the gate, said unto life, What dost thou offer me? And life replied, Sorrow, unceasing struggle, disappointment. After these, darkness and silence. The soul said unto death, What dost thou offer me? And death replied, In the beginning, what life gives at last. Turning to life, And if I live and struggle, Others shall live and struggle after thee, counting it easier where thou hast passed. 
and by their struggles? Easier place shall be for others, still to rise to keener pain of conquering agony. And what have I to do with all these others? Who are they? Yourself. And all who went before? Yourself? The darkness and the silence, too, have end? They end in light and sound. Peace ends in pain. Death ends in me. And thou must glide from self to self, as light to shade and shade to light again. Choose. The soul, sighing, answered, I will live. End of Life or Death Recording by Rhonda Fetterman End of Selected Works Poems by Valterine de Clare